Hello and welcome. I am Matt Roddy, and this is the Greater Prescott Podcast, where we talk about, you guessed it, all things Greater Prescott. Eric Moore is going to be my guest today. Eric, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you very much for the invitation. Absolutely. So we, one of the things I love about being mobile in terms of the podcast is we can set up wherever. Sure. So when I talk to a business owner, I love to be in their place of business. Well, Eric Moore is the owner of Jay's Bird Barn in Prescott. They also have a location in Flagstaff and right. we are in his informal <laughs> business as I would say, right? Sure. Yeah. In nature. Tell people where we are. We're in Watson Woods, yep. which is in Prescott along Granite Creek. Mm-hmm. Yep. And we'll get more into that. In today's episode, you get to learn a little bit about Eric's background, a little bit about what got him interested in birds, his current business, and really your love for birds and what our area means to that. Okay. You got you li- you guys are going to be shocked because <laughs> Eric and I have talked about this before, and I was mm-hmm. I was floored. And so, if you haven't been educated about the birds in this area. Just get ready. Okay. (laughs) So just to give people a spot of context, give us five or so minutes of where you were born and raised, your background, and you can fast forward to how you ended up here. Okay. So I was born in Massachusetts um, back in 1959, so uh, 61 years ago. Um, My dad was a high school teacher. He taught industrial arts, which back then meant like wood shop and drafting. Um, my mom was mostly a stay-at-home mother, and we lived in a little tiny town in western Massachusetts called Hamden. Okay. Maybe 3,000 people or something. Yeah. I don't know. It was a t- small town. But yeah. My dad taught in Springfield, Massachusetts, which was where I was born. And within the first year of my life, um, I developed asthma. Okay. And it was very severe, and it continued just nonstop. It just got worse and worse. Mm. And... Of course, back in the early 60s, um, there wasn't the modern medicines that we now have to treat asthma. And after many years of suffering Mm. and not having good health, um, my mother had taken me to Boston to meet with doctors there to see, you know, what we could do. And basically what they had said was the only thing we haven't tried is a change of climate. You know, um, so living in the east, there was a lot of mold and pollen and ragweed and humidity and just things that maybe triggered my asthma, you know. And so they suggested that my parents contact a school for asthmatic children in Tucson, Arizona. This was 1965. I had just turned six in August. And the school said they had openings. They had availability for to place me there. And so with the community's help to raise funds uh, for plane tickets, my parents flew with me out of Bradley Field in Hartford, Connecticut. And um, that was November, so about three months after I turned six years old. They flew with me to Tucson, and they took me to this private school called Saguaro School for Asthmatic Children. And they dropped me off, and they flew home. (laughs) <laughs> at six years old six years old so i had a very unusual upbringing i really did um so i was at that school for four years okay. in uh, in tucson and really you know a lot of people say things like that must have been really hard on you or how did you handle that and to be honest with you i don't have a lot of memories you, yeah. of that t- you know of what it was like at six mm-hmm. i mean i do remember of course being at the school uh, because by the time i left i was not quite 10 i was yeah. nine i turned 10 in august um and they moved to they moved to tucson the month i turned 10. so i was okay. there for basically four years but it was life-changing in the sense that the school was situated at the end of a road it was a dead-end road and there was nothing but Sonoran desert habitat surrounding the school. There was no homes. There was no businesses. The road was called Trails End Road. It was literally the end of the trail. And so part of our regiment for asthma and to get well was physical exercise. Uh, We had a PE instructor. Um, We lived on this campus year-round. So it had uh, a gymnasium. It had a swimming pool. It had... uh, dormitories, it had an infirmary, uh, it had a cafeteria, it had um, 
classrooms, and so all of our school instruction was right on that facility. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, I mean, we didn't have to leave the campus right. very often. And because we were surrounded by the desert, we spent a lot of time hiking in the desert. And my interest in birds had already started before going to Arizona, but okay. it really blossomed at that location. Uh, I can remember, you know, catching lizards and catching snakes and finding tortoises and yeah. seeing Gila monsters and, <laughs> of course, all the critters like centipedes or scorpions. And, I mean, I just lived in the desert. Right. Um, it was their yeah, habitat. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's where we were. And it was an interesting way to have a childhood because, you know, if you live at home, you probably don't spend that much time outdoors because your your life's a little more structured. But we had a lot of free time. Okay. I mean, we just lived there 24-7. Right. And so we just spent half of our time outside probably. So in 1969, my parents moved to Tucson and we rented a home for a little while before they bought a home. And um, that love continued. It was interesting. Um, not long after we moved to Tucson, or my parents moved to Tucson, um, I had taken little flyers around the neighborhood to solicit work. You know, I like do yard work. Yeah. And this, uh, this lady called me uh, from the flyer, said, I need some yard work done. So I went to her home, and she found out I was interested in birds. Well, I was all of about 12 at this point, and her name was Julianne, Julianne mm-hmm. Weigel. And she belonged to the Tucson Audubon Society. And prior to that time, I had never probably even heard of the Audubon Society. I mean, I was a kid. But um, she started taking me to their monthly membership meetings where they would have speakers and they would have programs. But even more importantly, she started taking me on field trips. She was a widow. She had never had any children. Mm. And so in a way, she was kind of like a surrogate grandmother. a gap, for sure. Yeah, for her and for me. Uh, Because my grandparents lived in Maine. Um, My parents were both born and raised in Maine, even though I was born in Massachusetts. So I rarely saw my grandparents. Um, And she was like a grandmother to me. And... um, so she started taking me on these organized field trips with leaders that were very knowledgeable and experienced gotcha. birders in the Tucson Audubon Society. And I have to say, Southern Arizona is one of the probably top five birding destinations in the United States to begin with. Really? Oh, yeah. So I grew up there. Of yeah. course, I, I didn't know that. <laughs> so because of Tucson's proximity to the Mexican border... Mm-hmm. And you, you think about birds that come up out of the tropics. Uh, you have the, the Mexican Rockies, the Sierra Madres. You have the American Rockies. Um, they kind of kind of meet in southeastern right. Arizona. Like you think of the Chiricahuas, the Huachucas, yeah. uh, those, those sky island mountain ranges. And so you have birds that come up out of the tropics where the northernmost extension of their range is southern Arizona. Mm-hmm. And so they are not seen really beyond that point in, yeah. in the United States. And so for people who are serious bird watchers, they come to Arizona because they can see birds in Arizona that they won't see anywhere else in the United States okay. because they just occur in that region, these sky islands. And so she was taking me to places like Patagonia and Sonoida and Santa Rita Mountains, you know, Madeira Canyon. And she took me down to the Huachucas and yeah. Sierra Vista and and for, you know, a 12, 13, 14, 15, and this went on for years, she was just driving me to these, on these field trips and introducing me to amazing birders. Yes. Um, and one of my idols as a kid was Roger Torrey Peterson. I had a lot of the Roger Torrey Peterson field guides okay. that he had authored and illustrated. And um, one of the unique experiences I had is when I was about 15, probably, 14, 15, is I got to meet Roger Torrey oh, Peterson great. in Tucson. So he came to the University of Arizona, and he did a book signing uh, because he had just finished uh, the publication of a book on the birds of Mexico. And the co-author was a man named Eddie Shalif, and Eddie lived in Tucson, and he was the president of the Tucson Audubon Society chapter. Go figure. And so the two of them collaborated to create this book. Eddie did a lot of the text. Roger did the illustrations, the plates, and they did the book signing at the University of Arizona in Tucson. Julianne took me to the book signing. So I got to get my book autographed by Roger Torrey (laughs) Peterson and, of course, Eddie Shalif, who I knew personally. Um, And so, I mean, as a young kid, I had this amazing opportunity to meet some really 
heavy hitters, so to speak, Absolute, in the bird world. What a pedigree. Yeah. So, <laughs> and I found out years later, which I thought was interesting. I mean, it's just coincidence, but it's interesting that Roger Tory Peterson and I share the same birthday. <laughs> right. uh, he, he was born on August 28th, and so was I. And it's like, wow, that's just really a cool coincidence. That's I mean, great. it means nothing, but it's just kind of yeah. interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was kind of my um, early beginnings of really getting into birds. Um, I actually built a blind. Uh, You know, a lot of people use blinds for photography or for hunting. Um, I built my first blind when I was about 12 years old for bird photography in Tucson and uh, made it out of palm fronds (laughs) because palm trees are very common in Tucson. (laughs) And uh, I would sit inside this little hut that I made with palm fronds and I would shoot pictures through the blind yeah. of uh, the birds that would come to my feeder. I had hummingbird feeders and suet feeders. Was and this water. at your house? Uh huh. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I eventually tore that blind down, made a much bigger one when I got a little older. And so I was really into photography as a teenager. I also did bird recordings. Mm. Uh, I would walk around the neighborhood with this little makeshift. I kind of made it parabolic receiver with a right. recording device and. I would record, recall, or record bird calls. So I was really kind of a nerd, I think you would say, at that age. I mean, yeah. most of my friends weren't running around bird watching and recording birds and doing yeah. bird photography when they were, you know, 13, 14, 15, but I sure was. That was yeah. just my passion. And exactly. It, I found it You're out not of, a nerd. <laughs> it was just simply your passion. <laughs> it was. But it's unusual to get into that hobby yeah. at that age. Most people don't get into birding right. when they're a teenager. They get into birding after they retire. Yes. So uh, it was kind of unusual. And so, you know, as a kid, I can remember telling my mom, I said, I want to go to Cornell. Cornell Mm. in Ithaca, New York has a program for ornithology, the study of birds. And so I told my mom when I was a teenager, I I want to go to Cornell and study birds never happened <laughs> so but that's that's my teenage yeah. years i guess you could say my growing up years yep. and how i got interested in birds yeah did you ever go to college i did okay so um i'm a member of the church of jesus christ of latter-day saints right and i served a mission first so yeah, where to uh believe it or not just texas okay. um you know you don't get to pick where you get to, right. c- to serve um i was called to serve in the dallas texas mission okay. mission boundaries basically were the northern half of texas from louisiana border to the new mexico border uh, Texas is a huge state, and it borders yeah. Louisiana on one side and New Mexico on the That's other side. That's not what I was thinking <laughs> you yeah. were going to say. <laughs> so, you know, it's a two-year mission, yep. um, and I spent most of my mission West Texas. I was okay. out in Midland and Lubbock and Amarillo area, but I did spend some time in the Dallas area. Okay. So after two years of serving a mission, um, I finally got serious about education, yep. and I ended up going to Brigham Young University yep. in Provo, Utah. And that's where I graduated. I okay. never went to Cornell. Yeah. And most people don't go to an Ivy League school, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, my grades weren't good enough anyways. <laughs> I, I, going back to high school, I was not serious about school because I was out bird watching. Right. I'm being serious. I was playing sports. That's why I wasn't serious. Yeah. I, I just, I gave no value to my education, which was really stupid in high school. Uh, I barely graduated. Uh, by the skin of my teeth, I graduated. Yeah. And um, so college was hard for me, I think, mm-hmm. because it was more serious. Um, I had dabbled in college maybe before my mission. Like uh, I went to the U of A actually for a little while in Tucson before yeah. my mission. But then when I, my parents moved to Utah when I was on my mission, oh, they'd okay. moved to a new house. And so I went back to a house I'd never lived in yeah, before after my tough. mission. And, you know, it's a kind of, kind of a tr- time of transition. So I um, started going to BYU, and uh, I've got a degree in business management okay. with a kind of a dual emphasis, marketing and retailing. Okay. Has nothing to do with birds. Yeah. Absolutely nothing. Ironically, when I was in high school, I started working at a grocery store. Mm. I needed money, so I started working at a grocery store. Well, when I moved to Utah, I started working in a grocery store. Okay. When I got my degree in business management, uh, several different grocery store companies came on campus to recruiting college graduates to enter their management you know, program. So I took a job with a grocery company. And so if you count all the years I did grocery, which was 
uh, high school, before my mission, after my mission, college. I did about 22 years in the grocery business. Okay. So lots of grocery yep. retail experience. However, um, what brought me to Prescott was the grocery business. I got transferred here to be the store oh. manager. Uh, there used to be a Smith's food and drug store <laughs> um, where Fry's is now on Miller Valley and okay. Fair Street. That's Fry's, but that used to be Fry's Smith's. Uh -huh. okay. I was the store manager. Yeah. That's what brought me here. Well, one day I was in the deli on uh, my lunch hour as the store manager reading the Arizona Republic newspaper. And there was an article in the Arizona Republic about this new store that had opened in Sun City called Wild Birds Unlimited. And I read that article and it was like, wow. And so I tore it out of the yeah. newspaper because it intrigued me. And the next time I was down in Phoenix, um, I went to that store and I, I literally, I, I walked in and it was like the hair on my neck went up. It was just like one of those tingling, just like, this is it. <laughs> this is it. And I walked to the counter. There's a lady at the cash register counter. And I said, excuse me, is this a franchise? And she said, yes. And I go, where do I write? Mm. Uh, you know, back then it was like you would write things. This was back in the 90s, I think. And so I, her name was Ann, Ann Blood, and met her and her husband. And we talked about the birding business. And so from that point on, I kind of had my heart yep. set on owning or operating a wild bird store. Mm -hmm didn't happen for probably another 10 years, yeah. truthfully. Um, but I did fly back to Indianapolis, which is where they're headquartered, Carmel, uh, Indian, Indian, Indiana. Met the franchisee, Jim Carpenter. He still runs the company. Wow. I know him personally. But I flew back there and learned about the Wild Birds Unlimited franchise. And so my heart was really set on, yeah. you know, opening a backyard wild bird store. But it took a long time to make it happen. And um, one of the decisions I had to make was, did I want to be a franchise yeah. or did I want to be an independent? Mm -hmm. And it was a struggle. But I finally decided I have 22 years of retail experience. I have a degree in business management. I have a degree in marketing and retailing. Um, I know a lot about the numbers and yeah. how to make a business run. And so I decided I didn't need to go the franchise route, that I didn't want to pay a franchise fee, a royalty fee every single month, national advertising fees constantly. And so I decided to do it on my own, okay. so to speak. And uh, so when this eventually started, which was not until 2003, okay. um, I quit my full-time job, took out a home equity line of credit, my wife and I had six kids at home. Mm -hmm. That's what your wife was doing in the meantime? Yeah, my stay wife was a stay-at-home mom. Yep. Uh -huh. um, we had had four children. I should back up a little bit. My wife and I had four sons. And um, when our youngest son was about four, we started doing some foster care. Oh, wow. So that was kind of a way to supplement our income, but also to help uh, care for foster children. And so my wife was very much a very busy, active, yes. stay-at-home mom with six children at home. And when I decided to start the Jay's, you know, start Jay's Bird Barn, um, that was a big leap of faith because I quit a full-time job that was had a you know steady income, yep. and went into debt to open a business with no income. <laughs> yes, that's what passion does. <laughs> it was pretty crazy looking back how we made this happen, yeah. but we started at Waters Garden Center. Okay. Here in Prescott. So um, I had approached the owner of Waters yeah. uh, earlier that year in 2003, Ken Lane. And I basically pitched my idea. And my idea was, I want to open my business on your property. Yeah. Because yeah. I thought, I need what a better place to have a wild bird store oh, than yeah. a, in a garden mm -hmm. center, in a nursery. Yeah. I just thought this is the ideal yeah. location. And also, in a sense, a sublease type of an agreement that just also helps a new business. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and he had this little building kind of in the back of his property that was used primarily for storage, but they also had like garden classes and okay. stuff in there when they had classes. 
and it was called the cottage and so he agreed that I could rent that space so they had to clear all their stuff out yeah. and um, I went in there and you know did a lot of uh, painting and okay. you know merchandising and put in some track lighting and of course I had to go buy fixtures and I had to order yeah. inventory and a cash register and mm -hmm. you know I had to get insurance and you know all the things to start a new business which was crazy and I literally did it in 30 days. Oh my goodness. Um, I, my last day of work uh, at my job was September 30th of 2003. And I opened Jay's Bird Barn on October 30th of 2003. In 30 days, it went from nothing to a business that was open yeah. and operating. And um, so we had a very humble beginning. Uh, yeah. the, s the first store was 575 square feet. Yeah. Tiny. tiny. Um, it didn't have an office. It didn't have a restroom. But, you know, we were at the Waters property, so I could use their restrooms. Oh, and I, I didn't have any, you know, carts, you know, like for customers to use or baskets or anything. So, you know, we just basically used what Waters had. Yeah. Uh, my seed deliveries would come in, and I would use, like, a pallet jack. You know, I, I was just basically um, taking advantage of the location of being at the nursery. Yeah. And... Pardon me. There's a bug yeah, that I keeps flying in my face. Outside podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> um, need a bird to swoop by and just catch it. So we were at Waters just a little over two years. Wow. Uh, not very long. No, that's but that's a it's a long time when you're in 575 square feet. Well, it, what was interesting is it it was an old like garage originally, and so it had a big roll up door. Okay. And so during business hours, that big roll-up door would be open, open, and so people could just kind of wander in yeah. and out. Well, can you imagine what it was like to be in there in November and December and January and February in this big roll-up door? It was miserable. Yeah. It was cold. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't enough space, ultimately, because business started to grow. Good. Yeah. But more interesting, what happened is the city at that time, Iron Springs Road was only four lanes, two in each direction. There was no center turn lane. And so whenever anybody wanted to turn left off of Iron Springs Road into the garden center area, they were in a lane of traffic. They were not in a turn lane. It was a very dangerous situation. And so the city um, decided to, you know, improve Iron Springs Road, put in curb and gutter and sidewalks in a center turn lane. But in order to do that, they needed to widen Iron Springs Road. Mm. Well, that process of widening affected us because our building space was in that area of eminent domain that they wanted to take. So we literally got a letter from the city that said, notice to vacate bye the bye. premises. Yeah. And it was scary because we were just two years old. You were just getting going. <laughs> yeah, we were. <laughs> Business was just starting to get established. And so the city's like, you need to move. And I was like terrified because Waters was all I had known and I liked the location. Right. But um, an opportunity came up to move to a suite in the uh, Willow Creek Safeway Shopping Center. And that's and at that time, this is 2005, there was Kmart. And wow. in addition to uh, Safeway, there were some big anchor tenants. Yeah. It was a busy shopping yeah. center. And so we decided to move and leave the, the nursery and uh, move over to the Safeway Center. So... This will tell you a little bit about our business and the way I do things. That year, 2005, New Year's Eve day was a Saturday. The 31st was a Saturday. We were open. We're open Monday through Saturday every week. We're closed on Sundays. Always have been. So we were open Saturday, December 31st, up until about 3 o'clock. Yeah. And about 3 o'clock, some friends from church and our family, our kids, we descended on the store Broke, we packaged up all the inventory, broke down all the, the uh, fixtures, the shelving and cabinets and everything, and we moved it all over to our new store location. We're closed on Sundays. We opened Monday morning in the new location, literally. That's um, impressive. Yeah, it was crazy. I mean, like, <laughs> because we don't work on Sundays, we did nothing. In fact, once on Sunday, once we had gotten everything out of the, the Waters building and into our new suite... At Saturday night, I wanted to set up. My wife's like, let's go home. Yeah, right. <laughs> so we went home. We didn't set up the store. And so Monday morning, which was now January 2nd, because January 1st fell on a Sunday. January 2nd, I woke up the kids about 6 a.m. 
because we have five sons and it's like okay we got to go to work yeah. and we went to the store monday morning and started setting up the fixtures and started putting inventory where we wanted it and we opened our doors at 8 30 that morning <laughs> we were not closed one minute moving our yeah. business crazy yeah. um and so we opened on January 2nd, 2006 in our current location. Wow. So we've been there ever Still since. There. Still there. Okay. We've more than doubled the size of the store since yeah. then. So we've grown a lot. Mm -hmm. um, we've had some interesting experiences along the way. This will kind of piggyback onto our moving okay. story, but we actually had a fire in our store. No kidding. Yeah, 2013 um, at our current location on a Sunday. We weren't there. Oh. Um, but I was in church and my cell phone was in my suit coat pocket and it started to vibrate and I pulled my cell phone out and I didn't recognize the number and so I put it back yeah. in my suit coat. I didn't answer it because I was in church. Well, after church, I went outside to pick up the message and it was the Prescott Fire Department and they were informing me that there was a fire at mm -hmm. the store and asking me to get there as quickly as I could. Well, of course, by now more than an hour had mm -hmm. passed. So by the time we got to the store, the fire had been extinguished, but because um, there was nobody there to allow them to gain access, they had to break out front windows to get into the building. And there was extensive water damage because of the sprinkler system being activated. And um, it was one of those very humbling um, times where um, it was just overwhelming emotionally Absolutely. to see your business basically destroyed yeah. by a fire and I called over to the church because it was a Sunday and I spoke to one of the, the men at the church and I said, I need help. And they came oh and like 40 men in white shirts and tie. I mean, they left church. They left church and yeah. came over and they just started helping us to move our inventory yeah. and fixtures out. And we called the property management company. Well, there was a suite about, I don't know, 75 feet down the sidewalk to the north of our suite that was vacant. Okay. And they said, you can use this suite in the meantime. Okay. So we spent that day moving our fixtures, moving our inventory, setting things up. Yeah. We opened the next morning at 8.30. <laughs> <laughs> I'm catching a, a trend here. Yeah, we were literally not closed one minute. Wow. We opened the next morning. Wow. We had no power, we had no gas. Um, right, yeah, right. Because it was an empty, it was, shell, it's, it's an empty suite. You know, you had to contact APS to yeah. get the power turned on, which took a few days. Yeah. And, but we were open. Yeah. Ironically, we had only been in that suite three weeks when a car was was left running in the parking lot. I don't know if it slipped out of gear or whatever, yeah. but it it went through the front of our store, the storefront of the one you had just moved into. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, we had a lot of challenges. You can't left. make this stuff no, up. No, you can't, and I'm not. So, literally, I had gone to bed. I don't remember what uh, night of the week it was. I don't know what week night it was, yeah. but let's say it was a Thursday night. Who knows? It doesn't matter. It's not relevant. But I had gone to bed, and my cell phone was plugged in in the bathroom adjacent to our master bedroom, and the phone started ringing. And it's like, ah, I'm not going to get out of bed to check it. And about a minute later, it started ringing again. It's like, okay, I better get out and check. Well, the second phone call was from one of my employees who had just gotten a phone call from the, po the police department. <laughs> that was the first call that I didn't answer. They tried me first. When they didn't reach me, they tried an employee. Mm -hmm. And informing me that a car had gone through the front of the store. And so I got dressed and went to the store. And um, by this point, it was December. I think it was December. Mm -hmm. So it was cold. cold. But anyways, I slept in the store on the floor that night to protect because, the yeah, merchandise. We had we had binoculars. I yeah. mean, we just couldn't leave it open. These, these binoculars, <laughs> they're not cheap. <laughs> no, this pair is about $2,800. Exactly. Uh, anyways, so I spent the night laying on the floor to sleep, which didn't really go very well, uh, mm -hmm. to protect the assets of the store. And then the, the next day, you know, they boarded up the windows yeah. and stuff like that, and they had to order new glass. and. But eventually, while we were in this temporary suite, our original suite got remodeled. You know, they had to rip out all the carpet, rip out the drywall because of the water damage, all the cabinetry. Um, but basically, we got a brand new store out of it. Yeah. You know, we got new carpet, new walls, yeah. new fixtures. And 
it was really interesting because it was almost like deja vu of moving from Waters to the shopping center. Mm -hmm. Same situation. It was a Saturday night. Oh, man. Um, where, you know, we had coordinated with the construction company that the okay. construction was all done. It was, you know, a month and a half later after the fire um, where we could move back in. So a lot of customers who knew of our situation said, you know, if you need help moving, let us know. And so we just made a party out of it. We ordered yeah. pizza. We had customers come. It's like, okay, come, come Saturday at 4 o'clock right. and we'll start moving okay. fixtures over. And so in, in one evening, we moved all of the fixtures back, yeah. all the inventory back. Saturday night, closed Sunday, open Monday morning at yeah. 8.30. So again, we, we were not closed for one minute. Man, oh man. So we've, we've worked hard. Oh, I mean, yeah. we have, I mean, growing this business from a point where you had no customers and no sales because you open your door and you're an unknown commodity. Nobody's ever heard of Jay's Bird Barn because mm -hmm. it didn't exist. It's not like when you open a new Wendy's or a new McDonald's restaurant, right. you, you know, that everybody knows about it and you have customers the day yeah. you open. The, it's a the, franchise. There's largely a check sheet of <laughs> what you need to do. Yeah, and you're a known commodity. Right. The, I can remember the, the day we opened, November 30th, pardon me, October 30th of 2003, mm -hmm. I had four customers that day yeah. that just wandered in from the, the, yeah, right. the nursery. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. you know, it's like wandered into our big roll-up door and checked us out. And so I had yeah. four customers. The second day I had two customers, yeah. two customers. Yeah. Um, so there were many lean times for a long time mm -hmm. until we really got going. But moving to the Safeway Shopping Center was a big boost. Because what we found is while the setting of the nursery was lovely and beautiful, not too many people go to a garden center in November and December and January and February because yes. they're not gardening. There's. And so even though the garden center is open, they're not doing a lot of business. There's right. not a lot of traffic. But being next to a grocery store, you have built-in traffic every, every day, day, all day. Yeah. Thousands of people are going mm -hmm. to Safeway Good every point. single day. And so we had this traffic built in. And literally our first year... Our sales probably increased more than 50%. Oh, yeah. First, the yep. first year in the mm -hmm. new location. Yeah. And the next year, like, again. Just, and, I mean, our business just really took off. It really grew yeah. being in the new Great location. Great work. Thanks. To you and your wife. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the boys. <laughs> yeah, right. And the church and all your friends. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a team effort. Wow. Yeah. So that's kind of, you know, a little history on Jay's Bird Barn. Yeah. I've always wondered... Why is it called Jay's Bird Barn? Good question. So my father-in-law, his name was Jay. Um, my wife's dad, I never met him. He passed away when my wife was a senior in high school. Mm. So um, I ha didn't, hadn't met my wife yet. Uh, her, my wife's name is Gayla. So after my mission, when I was working at a grocery store, I met my wife in the grocery store. Okay. And uh, when we got married and had our first child, and it was a boy, she wanted to name it after her dad. Yeah. So our, our first son, his name is Travis J. We gave him the middle name of J after his mm -hmm. grandfather. And when J was 12 years old, I helped him start a business uh, because I wanted my kids to have an opportunity to work and earn Absolutely. money like I did when I was a kid yes. doing yard work and stuff like that. And so we actually started a business called Jay's Birding Service because I was so into birds and I was trying to get my kids into birds. Mm -hmm. And Jay's birding service was basically um, like pet sitting, but for wild birds. Okay. So people who were serious about feeding birds, they didn't, if they went on vacation for any length of time, they didn't want their hummingbird feeders to go empty gotcha. or their bird baths to dry out. Yeah, keep the feeders filled, yeah. keep the birds happy. And so we literally created this business uh, to cater to bird watchers <laughs> yeah. when he was 12 years old. Yeah. And, and we named it after him because it was his business. Yeah. So Jay's birding service eventually morphed into Jay's Bird Barn, where right. we went from having no store into having a bricks and mortar store. Yeah. And eventually That's that funny. side of the business went away because we couldn't do, right. you know, be running to people's <laughs> homes to fill a hummingbird feeder when we had to be in the store, you mm -hmm. know, doing customer service. But yeah. that's how it got started. Yeah. So it's a play on words as well because. Um, there are a lot of J's in Arizona and okay. North America. So here in Prescott, mm -hmm. we have Scrub J's, we have Stellar's J's. On a rare occasion, there's a Pinion J. So we have okay. lots of J's. Yeah. And my name's Eric, not J. Nope. And well, that's why I asked the question. <laughs> I get, it's hilarious. Uh, I, even when I told my wife, 
or I still fumble over it. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to go over and talk to Jay. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, no, wait. It's Eric. <laughs> yeah. I get called Jay every day yeah. of my life. Yeah. And it's funny because I've lived in Prescott now for 29 years. Okay. Long before I opened Jay's Bird Barn, I've known people through the church and through the community or through Smith's. And so people have known me for 30 years, and they'll look me right in the eye and go, hey, Jay, how you doing? It's like, yeah. you know I'm not Jay. It's like, oh, I'm it's sorry. Just, yes. <laughs> I mean, they've known me it's as Eric. Fault. Yeah, oh. it's kind of funny. Yeah. Because they've known me as Eric for years, and then they call me Jay. And it's like, you yeah. know better than that. Exactly. But I yeah, get yeah. called Jay all the time, and I don't care. It doesn't matter. Right. So. Uh, well, thanks for sharing all that. I mean, Yeah, it, it was a lot. Sorry. And it really helps to give context. That's why I like this format. Yeah. Like I shared with you before we started. I think that's what really makes this rich so that people just get a sense of who you are why you are the way you are i just yeah i think it's fascinating oh mm-hmm. good yeah thank you let's talk about birds okay because we are in an area that when i moved here i had no idea and not until uh-huh. i met you did i begin to get a grasp on how rich of an area we have for birds so do. educate people sure so you know, we, Prescott is situated in an area that's sometimes referred to as the Arizona Central Highlands. Uh, this area is kind of an elevated landform that runs throughout the, m- the middle part of the state of Arizona. Uh, to the south of the Central Highlands, you have the Sonoran Desert. Mm. To the north of the Central Highlands, you have the Colorado Plateau. We sit in between, so we're in this middle region of Arizona. Well, because of where we are, we have very diverse habitats, and birds are habitat dependent. We have grasslands, we have chaparral, we have pinyon juniper, we have uh, ponderosa, we have mixed conifer. And so we have all these different habitat types. We have riparian corridors where there's rivers, we have lakes that are man-made, like Willow Watson, uh, Goldwater Lynx. Well, all of these different habitats lend themselves to different types of birds. So here in Prescott, um, we've got a, a, a very knowledgeable birder named Carl Tomoff, and he's been keeping a record of all the birds that have been documented. Okay. Within a 10-mile radius of the Prescott Courthouse Plaza, 10-mile radius, over 365 species have been seen over the course of time that Carl's been keeping records. Mm-hmm. Well, if you look at North America, and when I say North America, it's from the Mexico border all the way up to Canada and Alaska. Okay. That's North America from a birding perspective. Um, About 800 species of birds occur in North America. 365 of those have been seen within a 10-mile radius of the Prescott Courthouse Plaza. That is phenomenal. You'd have a hard time going anywhere in the United States and finding 365 species in a 10-mile radius. Anywhere in the United States. I mean, it would be hard to accomplish that. Right. So we are very fortunate to live in an area that is rich with a diversity or variety of birds. Uh, We're sitting today in Watson Woods, and I'm listening to a variety of birds. I've been hearing, like, right there. I don't know if people can hear it, but that's a yellow warbler, for example. I've been hearing little bush tits. I've been hearing blue grosbeaks. I mean, we're surrounded by birds in this lovely Mm -hmm. riparian, you know, cottonwood gallery, this little forest here. Yeah. And so Prescott's... An amazing place to have for birds. And that's one reason why our business is so successful. You know, I told people, you know, that I couldn't have a successful business in Blythe or Bullhead because Mm -hmm. they don't have the diversity of birds that we have Mm -hmm. here. I mean, you know, depending where people live in Prescott, like people who live maybe in Timber Ridge or Groom Creek, you know, where you're in the the Pines pines. or Walker, you know, they're going to get chickadees and nuthatches and woodpeckers and, Mm -hmm. you know, but somebody who maybe lives in a chaparral area, they're going to get gambles quail and they're going to get canyon towhees and, Mm -hmm. you know, and if you live out in a grassland, you're going to get meadowlarks and horned larks and lark sparrows and so all these different (laughs) habitats have different birds. So it's really amazing. So people who move here, will be richly rewarded depending where they live well, of course. In, in the area. But we p- play to that. You know, in our business, like when people come in and they say, I need to buy some bird seed, yeah. and yeah. they've never bought with us before, our very first question, we look them in the face and we say, where do you live? Yeah. Because where you live determines what kind of birds you're going to get yeah. in your yard. Because if you live in a really good habitat, you're going to get a diversity of birds. It's, exactly. I have customers that have, have recorded over 100 species of birds in their yard. And most yards in Prescott are not that big. They're less than an acre. You know, Prescott doesn't have big yards. No. Uh, so if you can get over 100 over species. over 10% <laughs> of the North American <laughs> variety. Oh, yeah, over in 10%. In someone's backyard. Yeah, in their yard. You're, yeah. That's a great point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Prescott's a great place yeah. for birders. Um, it really is. And 
you can sit like for example in my backyard uh-huh. i know we have house finch sure i think it'd be a blue jay it's scrub jay probably scrub, it's it's got some blue in it uh-huh does um, it have a crest or not? A lot of quail, not a crest, no cre- I don't think. So that's a scrub jay. A scrub jay. Uh-huh. It has a personality. Oh, they have, uh, yeah, they're sassy. They're very <laughs> sassy because the, 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 the other birds aren't. Yeah, they, um, they, they intimidate and scare the other birds. Yes, that's what they try to do to the quail that come uh-huh. in to feed. Yeah. <laughs> well, unfortunately, the scrub jays somewhat, are somewhat predatory during I, breeding season, and they'll eat baby quail things, or bird eggs, things yeah. like that. So yeah. other birds are fearful of them. Yeah. Yeah, they kind of rule the roost. So the fact uh. that you can drive, well, 30 minutes in uh-huh. any direction and get a huge variety of birds is... It's phenomenal. Yeah, you know, it's interesting is you look at uh, topographically, like yeah. Prescott, if you're starting north of Prescott, you're in a grassland. Okay. And as you come into Prescott from the north, so you're heading south, you're going to be going up in elevation. Eventually, you would hit the Bradshaw Mountains okay. and the Prescott National Forest. So you transition from a grassland into chaparral, and chaparral mm. into pinyon juniper, pinyon juniper into ponderosa, ponderosa into eventually like mixed conifer where you're going to be up in the firs yeah. and the pines in the Bradshaws. Yeah. And in between all that, you're going to be crossing <laughs> riparian corridors. Ooh, yeah. Cooper's Hawk. Did you see it? No. Ah, Cooper's Hawk just flew right okay. by. Yeah. Um, sorry. No, this is, <laughs> this is awesome. <laughs> Get distracted by a bird. You can't this stuff. <laughs> no, you can't. And that's kind of the fun of birding yeah. is, you know, when you go bird watching, you never know what you're going to see that yeah. day. And I you get know. to be in nature. Yeah. Yeah. You get to be outdoors. It's a win-win. Yeah. Well, this segues perfectly. Talk about just why it is that you love birds so much. What is it about it that yeah. really, I mean, you said passion earlier. Yeah. That's it a is a passion. Word. It started young. I, I tell people that I started bird watching when I was five. And I say that only because I don't really have memories before I was five. But I know that by the age of five, I was watching the birds at the feeders at my Mm. parents' home and my grandparents' homes uh, in Maine and Massachusetts. So I know that I was seeing and watching birds at that age, and that interested me. And then my experience at the School for Asthmatic Children kind of built on that. But a lot of it for me maybe is my connection to God, is is that I believe God is the creator of all these things. And that when I'm in nature and I'm witnessing his creations, it is a reminder to me of his power and his glory Amen. and his magnificence. That Amen. This is all part of God's yep. handiwork and his creation. So it's, mm-hmm. it ties me to him. It's a connection to him yeah. that I see God in my life through his creations. Yep. And I enjoy it. I find joy in it. And I think God gave us these things to give us joy. To bring pleasure. Yeah. I yeah. would agree. Yeah. Um, so that's a big part of it. Yeah. I, I love the thrill of seeing something new that maybe I've never seen before. I mean, here's here's the thing, especially when I was young. You know, I would go through bird books and you and oh, you look man. at you look at the plates, you look <laughs> at the images, and and for years you might look at a bird in a book and you've never seen it, and on one day you see it in real life for the first time, and, and, and it's like. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I can like, for, really for example, neat. I can remember the first time I saw a goshawk, a northern mm. goshawk. And I was high up in the Uinta Mountains in northeastern Utah. I was on a Boy Scout hike. I was a leader. And I had gone into this like little meadow clearing. And there were some deer. And I was just kind of looking at some stuff. And this goshawk came swooping in and landed on a branch of a pine tree. And I was just like right there. And it's just like, you know, you just like slowly bring your <laughs> yeah. binoculars up. It's like, and it's just like one of those magical moments where yeah. I had seen goshawks in books for 10 years, 15 years. I don't know. I was in my right. mid, mid-20s by now. Yep. But I'd never seen one in mm-hmm. nature. And so um, it creates a lot of memories for me yeah. of where I was, when oh, I experienced man. it. And it's given me an opportunity to travel. So I've been to Africa, okay. I've been to South America, I've been to Central America. And there's a big world out there. Oh, man. And it's a beautiful world. We are blessed to live in a beautiful, beautiful <laughs> world. And there's beautiful birds. Yeah. And um, I've probably seen a couple thousand different bird species okay. now. There's only about 10,000 bird species in the world. I was just going to okay. Approximately, you know, yeah. 10,000 range. And, and how many have you seen approximately? A couple thousand. Yeah. Wow. But That's I, l- I want to see more. Yeah, you know, of course. It's like, <laughs> it's like a never-ending bucket list <laughs> yeah. in a sense. Yeah. yeah. 
<laughs> so I, I find a lot of pleasure in traveling. This year, earlier this year, we went to Trinidad and Tobago oh, before wow. the c- coronavirus really kicked in. It was in January. We went, yeah. to, we went down there, visited the two islands, and mm-hmm. uh, had a great experience. Really enjoyed it. Oh, um, Two years before that, we'd gone to uh, Costa Rica. Two years before that, we'd gone to Belize. Before that, we went to Brazil. Okay. Um, before that, I went to Africa. So yeah. I do have goals. I want. I have a trip planned for next year uh, to Oaxaca, Mexico, and okay. hoping that will happen, that the How coronavirus... How far south is Oaxaca? Really far. Okay. Yeah, uh, south of Mexico City. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So and I, I understand it's probably one of the best birding places in Mexico. Huh. Okay, the there's two more things we will finish with. Okay. Y- earlier you mentioned bird seed. Mm-hmm. Explain a little bit about when people come in and asking for bird food. Sure. So the one thing that we, how we have differentiated ourselves from all the competition, because we have a lot of competition, believe it or not. You can buy bird seed at Walmart. You can buy bird seed at mm. Costco, at Home Depot, at True Value, at Olson's Grain. I'm the grocery store or drug store tractor supply it doesn't matter you can buy bird seed pretty much every retail store that's around okay the problem is when you buy bird seed at a box store or a national chain the company that produces that makes it for walmart or they make it, they make it for yeah. true value yeah and then they distribute it to all their stores mm-hmm. so whether you shop at walmart in florida or texas or ohio or washington state you're getting the exact same bird bag seed. of bird seed mm-hmm. so it's a very generic bird seed but it's also filled with filler ingredients okay. mostly milo sometimes wheat sometimes corn it just has lots and lots of filler ingredients and the thing is birds are they have dietary preferences you know some birds like sunflower seed some birds like peanuts some birds like safflower some birds like millet and if you have a generic bird seed that's not geared for a specific habitat then what you're going to find is the birds at your feeder will kick out of the feeder a lot of the stuff they don't want to get out the selected ingredients they do want so we made the decision to make our own bird seed blends all of our bird seed blends are mixed right here in Prescott. Wow! At Yavapai Exceptional Industries, which is uh, a nonprofit, we partner with them. We outsource the production to them, so we own all the equipment, we own all the product. They perform the labor. Um, I I email them every Monday, mm. and I this is my order, and then okay. I pick it up on Friday. So our seed oh, is wow. mixed every single week. It's fresh. It contains no milo, no wheat, no corn. Um, and they're geared for certain habitats. Yeah. So if a person says, I live in, um, let's say, Cliff Rose, and I'll say, okay, then this is the kind of bird seed you need okay. to feed for where you live. Or, gee, I live in Prescott Lakes. Or, gee, I live out Williamson Valley. Or, I live in Forest Trails. Or, I live in Timber Ridge. Or, I live in Quail Hollow. Mm-hmm. We can go on and on and on and yeah. name all the different subdivisions in Prescott. But we literally have blends that are formulated to work in different habitats awesome. in different it. neighborhoods in Prescott. Yeah. And so it works. Yep. Um, we find that once people buy our bird seed, they don't go back to the box store, you, hardware store, or feed store. Right. Because they've experienced a difference. We literally tell people, I guarantee them, I say, you will get a wider variety of birds and you'll get a larger quantity of right. birds when you feed our bird seed. Yeah. And it's true. Yeah. It's absolutely true. Yeah. Yeah. It's fun. So it's fun. All right, let's wrap it up. Okay. I've got some fun questions for you. Oh, boy. Give me the first answer that comes to your mind. <laughs> Here we go. Okay. What's your favorite thing about Greater Prescott? Outdoors. What's your favorite restaurant in Greater Prescott? Oh, boy. I'm a stay-at-home person. I'm not a foodie. Okay. What's, I, I, what's the number one thing on your Greater Prescott bucket list? To do? Yeah. Yeah. I've already hiked the circle trail. Uh, I just want to keep bird watching in Prescott. Yeah. And see all the birds that ever come through Prescott. What all three hundred and sixty five. What yeah. bird is the highlight of your birding career? One of the really special experiences mm-hmm. for me was when we were in the Amazon in Brazil and we saw the Guyanan cock of the rock. Okay. Crazy looking bird, but we found a lek where males come together and display to attract a female. And we were in this humid, humid, hot, hot, hot (laughs) jungle, sweat just dripping off of us. And I'm not a sweater. I don't sweat. But in the tropics, you sweat. In (laughs) Amazon. And we found this lek where the males were displaying. And it was just one of those amazing, wow moments. Another one was 
in Costa Rica when we saw the resplendent quetzal, okay. which is a bird that is like a trogon, but it's got this tail. The tail feathers are probably this long. Whoa! Yeah, the tail feathers. Uh, and we saw it, and it's just like, again, these are birds I've seen in of books course. for 40 years now, 50 mm. years now. And to see it in real life is yeah. just like so fulfilling and so rewarding and so amazing. And you may only see the one. Yeah. Or, and the, the and thing that is, one time anyway. Yeah, because <laughs> chances are I'll probably never go back to Costa right. Rica in my life. Yep. You know, and so I've seen it. So it's kind of a bucket list kind of thing. Yeah. What are three words that you use to describe living in Greater Prescott? I enjoy the peace of our community. Mm-hmm. It's a very peaceful place. I enjoy the the beauty of the outdoors and the nature. So I'll say peace, beauty. Um, just a very comfortable place to live. Yep. I really love it. If you weren't a birder, uh-huh. what would you be doing? Ha! Probably something in retail, just okay. because I enjoy retail. Yeah. Yeah. Last question. What's your favorite summer activity in Greater Prescott? Uh, that's... You already know the yeah, answer. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Getting it's out. It's not as easy for a lot of people, but for you, it's bird watching and out being outdoors and bird watching. Yeah, yeah. Tell really people f- where they can find you. Sure. So we're in the Safeway Shopping Center on Willow Creek Road, which is ten forty six Willow Creek Road. If you know where Cal Ranch and Beals and Little Caesars Pizza are, kind of right across the street from Yavapai Regional yep. Medical Center, the hospital. Mm-hmm. So yep. easy to find. We're open Monday through Saturday, 9 to 5.30. We're closed on Sundays. And we are a backyard wild bird and nature gift store with wild bird supplies, including seed feeders and optics for nature observation, books, stuff like that. You also have a Flagstaff store. Uh So if you happen to hear this and you live in Flagstaff, Mm -hmm. stop in. Yeah. Yeah. In the Sprouts Shopping Center in Flagstaff. Okay. And we have Hallmark. Okay. Yeah. I mean, we have a complete Hallmark Gold Crown store inside Jay's Bird Barn. That's one of the things we did when we expanded. Gotcha. Yeah. So after the fire. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. You guys, I hope you learned something new today. Thank you so much for watching. If you need anything bird related, literally just pick up the phone and call. Yeah. Amazing resource. Thank you. The guys in the store, the gals in the Mm -hmm. store. No, we have great employees. Exactly. Yeah. It's not just me. It's everybody in the store. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. You're not going to be the one answering the phone. No, most likely. not likely. Yeah. <laughs> so you guys, thank you so much for watching. Please support Eric at Jay's Bird Barn and have a great day. Thank you.